This Torah portion is called Vayetze Yaakov, which means, and Jacob went. It refers to Jacob beginning his journey to Padan Aram to find a wife among the kindred of Laban, who is his uncle, his mother Rebecca's brother. He stops on the way and uh, sleeps in a place. It's called the place. Uh, so it may have been known as a particularly holy spot. He lies down to sleep and has a prophetic dream. This is the dream of Jacob's ladder. The ladder is set on the earth and its top reaches toward the heavens and angels are going up and down. The text states that YHVH was standing at the top of the ladder over him and thus begins another prophetic encounter. He promises the land that he's lying on to Jacob and his seed after him. And he also promises numerous offspring and that God will be with Jacob until he has finished doing the things that he has in store for him. Jacob wakes up and is stunned by the revelation, acknowledging that the place where he slept was the abode of God, but he did not know it. It's also the gate of the heavens. Uh, some commentators believe that uh, this site was to become the site of the first temple and or uh, was where Abraham and Isaac uh, climbed to uh, for the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, which is called the place as well when Abraham spies it from afar. Jacob uh, pours oil over the stones that he rested his head on that night and makes it into a pillar. He calls it Beit Ale, the house of God, the house of Ale. But before that it was called Luz, which can mean almond, but Luz, as we know from the Latin, can also mean light. So Jacob swears, makes a vow, that if he returns safely to Canaan after his sojourn with Levan, that he would make that place a house of God and that he would tithe. Jacob makes his way to Padan Aram and comes upon a well covered by a large rock and the shepherds are there waiting for everyone else to arrive before they're able to lift the rock up off the top of the well to water their sheep. Jacob asks if they know Laban, and they do. Then they say that his daughter Rachel is on her way with her sheep, as she is one of Laban's shepherds. Jacob demonstrates a personality trait by chiding the shepherds in a way, uh, by telling them that the day was still young, and why are they just hanging around the well? Why don't they continue to graze their sheep? But they explain that they need all of the shepherds there to uh, combine their strength to lift the rock off the well. Upon seeing Rachel, Jacob is inspired. There's a lot of different levels of prophetic experience. One clearly is um, interacting with angels or with God. Another lower level of prophetic experience is unusual strength. Uh, so it appears that upon seeing Rachel, Jacob is inspired and single-handedly removes the rock from the well and waters all of the sheep. Apparently, without saying a word, he kisses Rachel and then lifts his voice up in a loud cry and weeps. Why exactly, we don't know. From happiness, from sadness, from portentousness, is anybody's guess. He tells Rachel that he is her cousin. She then runs home and gets her father, Levon, and Jacob stays with him for a month. Now it's not clear what he's doing that month, but in any event, at the end of a month, Levon asks him to stay and to work for him, for money, for a wage which suggests that Jacob was working for Laban free of charge before that, most likely as a shepherd. When Laban asks Jacob what his wages would be, he asks to marry Rachel. But 
Rachel is the younger of two daughters, the older of which is Leah. Now Leah is not so pretty, she's got weak eyes or delicate eyes, rock coat, which can mean several things. But the term does not imply strength uh, or sturdiness or beauty even. Um, on the other hand, Rachel is described as beautiful of appearance, beautiful of form. So Jacob works for Laban for seven years, and on the evening of the wedding night, Laban switches Rachel for Leah. He takes Leah into Jacob's tent, and Leah and Jacob have sex that night. And Jacob w wakes up and uh, is deceived, which is ironic because of his history of deceit. And he complains to Laban, who then says, well, it's not a custom in our land to marry off the younger before the older. In the meantime, he gives one of his maidservants to Leah to serve as one of Leah's maidservants. Her name is Zilpah. They spend a week celebrating uh, the marriage of Leah and Jacob. And then in exchange for Jacob promising to work seven more years, uh, Laban also gives him Rachel as a wife and also gives Rachel Bilhah, who is one of Laban's maidservants. Because of Leah being unloved, so to speak, God has mercy on her and opens her womb. And she begins to bear a lot of children, six sons and one daughter. Her six sons become six of the 12 sons of Jacob, who ultimately become the 12 tribes of Israel. Reuben, Simon, Judah, Issachar, and the like, Levi. Once it's become clear that Rachel, like the other matriarchs, uh, is barren, similar to Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, the maidservant of Sarah, uh, Rachel asks Jacob to sleep with her maidservant, Bilhah, and Bilhah has two sons. One is Dan, and the other is Naphtali. So Leah figures that two can play this game, and she gives her maidservant, Zilpah, to Jacob, who has two more children. One is called Gad, and the other is named Asher, A-S-H-E-R. Now, there's a little interlude here. One of Leah's sons finds these flowers in the field called Dudaim, although singular would be Duda, and uh, no one really knows what these are or why they're so prized, but in any event, Rachel requests the Dudaim from Leah, and Leah refuses unless Rachel lets her sleep with Jacob that night. So it's kind of a, like a wage uh, that Rachel <clears throat> exchanges the Dudaim for conjugal rights that evening. So Jacob comes back from the field and sleeps with Leah, and they have another child, and his name is Issachar. So finally, Leah has one more son with Jacob, whose name is Zebulun, and a daughter named Dina, who will figure prominently uh, in an upcoming portion. Finally, God remembers Rachel, opens her womb, and she gives birth to Joseph. Now that Jacob's favorite has given birth, he uh, goes to Laban and says, I want to go home now. I want my wives, I want my children, and I want to go back to Canaan to be with Isaac. He doesn't mention his mother, Rebecca, who we assume has passed away by this point. It's been 14 years already. So Laban prevaricates. He says, well, I'll send you away if you work for me seven more years. And in the meantime, I will give you some sheep that you, or some goats and some sheep that you can breed. And this gets a little weird, and I've spent I spent a few days trying to organize and uh, define and label the different 
uh, patterns and the colors of the sheep and the goats that go to Laban, that go to Jacob. Uh, suffice it to say, it's rather complicated. They're spotted, they're dappled, they're striped, they're ringed, uh, they're brown, uh, they're males, they're females, the, uh, some are early bearing, some are late bearing. You know, if you're not really keen on this kind of material, you can skip over it um, without too much of a loss other than realizing how punctilious uh, both Laban and Jacob are uh, regarding whose animals are whose. So Jacob engages in some kind of a breeding program which involves peeling bark from wood poles, stripping the bark off of certain tree branches and placing them in front of the male sheep, the female sheep, when either or both of them are sexually active. And as a result thereof, uh, the kinds of sheep and goats that are born all end up with Jacob. So as a result, there's a lot of sheep and goats that end up with Jacob, and he becomes exceedingly rich. Now, as it turns out, in a description of an interaction later, there was a prophetic dream that Jacob had where an angel described to him uh, the method of producing the right colored and right patterned animals. Otherwise, one might accuse Jacob of divination, sorcery, improper mixing, those kinds of things, but uh, because it was a prophetic dream that instructed him how to do these things. He's free of those accusations. So Laban's sons let Jacob know that Laban is displeased with all of the abundance of livestock that Jacob has amassed for himself, and they accuse him of stealing from their father. At that point, Jacob decides that he better get out of there, and he calls to his wives, and they agree that it's time to leave. He's also told to leave by the angel who had described also the breeding protocol. So we learn about the breeding protocol and we also learn that the angel tells Jacob that it's time to return to Canaan. So Jacob flees. He flees with his four wives, his 12 children. The final one of the sons, the twelfth of the sons, is named Benjamin, but he's not born until the next portion. Laban is a few days away doing some sheep shearing, and that is the opportunity that Jacob takes to escape. So once more, he's being kind of devious, but it's also for the sake of himself and his family and his riches. Now Laban, once he finds out about Jacob having fled, gets his people together and uh, is about to go off in hot pursuit. And God appears to him that evening in a prophetic dream. So this is another example that a pagan can experience a prophetic state if the circumstances call for it. So God warns Laban to not harm Jacob. So Laban encounters Jacob and his entourage, and Laban complains, saying, why didn't you tell me I would have sent you all off with music and song and a great feast, and why did you uh, steal my heart? Now, interestingly enough, Rachel stole some of what is called teraphim, which are variously understood uh, to be small objects, which Levon uses for divination, for predicting the future. They're apparently little idols. They're Laban's gods. They're referred to as Laban's gods. Well, and, and it's unclear exactly why Rachel stole those, perhaps to confuse Laban so he wouldn't know what to do. But in any event, you know, Laban uh, meets up with you know, Jacob's entourage and they begin relating. Uh, Jacob didn't know that Rachel stole the teraphim and Laban says, well, 
you know, this is all right, okay, I understand what you're doing, but why did you steal my teraphim? So Jacob gets angry and complains that, among other things, that he's had to endure from Laban. Now he's being accused of stealing his instruments of divination. So Jacob makes a vow out loud, saying, the person with whom the teraphim are found will die. So Laban rummages around everyone's tents. Rachel stuffs the, uh, the teraphim in a camel bag and stays seated on it and refuses or doesn't stand up when Laban comes into her tent claiming that she's having her period and it would be unseemly for her to get up at the moment. Then Laban and Jacob have a fairly heated exchange where Jacob accuses Laban of all of the things that he's had to suffer through. Almost 20, 21 years of servitude, more or less. Well, so Laban is un, unmoved. He ends up saying, the sons are my sons, the daughters are my daughters, the animals are my animals. I've got enough strength in my hand to injure you, but your God appeared to me last night or the other night um, and told me not to harm you. So strangely enough, Laban asks if Jacob and he can make a pact, a non-aggression pact, more or less. They erect a pillar, which is a witness of the covenant or the treaty that they make with each other. It's an agreement to not go beyond the monument or the pillar in order to harm one another, but they could to commerce with each other, to benefit each other. And Laban also makes Jacob swear that he will not take any more wives. He's already got four, two of whom are Laban's daughters. So they make a feast, they each go on their way. Then as Jacob begins again making his way to Canaan, he encounters a group of angels, a camp of angels. And he calls the place Machanaim, which means camps. So it's a busy Torah portion. There's 12 children born. There's a lot of give and take, a lot of skullduggery and intrigue. Uh, nobody comes off looking all that great, but so it goes. The um, book that I refer to, um, or the publication, uh, for my everyday Torah reading is the Saperstein Rashi. Rashi is one of the main medieval commentators. He's kind of the one everybody begins with. So I've been referring to these for a long time. That's the editions of the Torah that I have been scribbling my notes into for the last 20 or so years. The series is published by a company which is called Art Scroll. And well, so the Hebrew is on one side, the English is on the other. Other Rashi is below in English, and then there's a commentary on the Rashi. So it's quite extensive, and they do make references to other commentators. So most people begin with Rashi, and then if they're interested, they move on to the other commentators. Nachmanides and Ibn Ezra are the other two of the uh, three major medieval commentators. So I hope you like the video. If you do, click like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. The next Torah portion is Vayishlach, which uh, uh, recounts the reconciliation between Esau and Jacob.